Well, this little changeover illustrates one of the problems. Life gets too complicated. Too many gizmos, too many gadgets, too much software. So I'm going to take up with uh, Scott and uh, let's go for a ride. The slides are not terribly professional, but maybe they'll do. So to the question here, I, I didn't get your name when you... Even? What Scott was into is this crude diagram. How do we think about business? And there are as many answers to that as there are people, and particularly professors and CEOs. So they all have a different take. But in general, you start with something small and you keep adding value through the stages. First principle of business, you got to take in more money than you spend. Even if you're running a school or an NGO, that's true. You got a budget. You can't overspend your budget because that's the way things work. And now at the end, you hope there is somebody who has the money that's going to pay for all of this. And so that's the GNP's designed this way. It's a stack up of value. What's a value? Well, we value is whatever we think it is. And so, if you go back to the beginning of this, why did we want to move all that stuff from the very beginning? So what does it got take to go from ore in the ground to way out here where we hopefully a customer pays? Let's look at this as, you know, I don't have anything to add to Scott. I remember talking about with HP about uh, uh, postponement like 25, 30 years ago. A lot of people haven't begun it yet, but the concept is not at all new. But we keep adding a few twists and we can get it more complicated and we can improve the information efficiency and so on. And everybody knows a lot of the hazards. So let's don't belabor. I think most of you have seen at one time or another the bow tie model of logistics. We call it production there, but you could be at any stage. Warehousing, retail, back up somewhere you're doing smelting or something. So we have all these stages going through the bow tie. Wherever you are is the choke point in the bow tie. Stuff comes into you, it goes out from you. Therefore, everybody sees it just a little bit differently. And if you're a manufacturer, that's, you know, if you started in that, that's where your heart is, of course. And you tend to think, well, that must be the center of the universe. It isn't. Neither are any of the other stages. But we tend to think that whatever we do is the center of everything. That leads to a lot of trouble. And so we're trying this sustainability stuff, mostly with reuse. And in some places, you know, like aluminum, uh, I understand the, the can people are now up past 70% on recycle rate. Pretty good, actually. And uh, Dave Roper, who's a physicist at uh, Virginia Tech, he's retired to like about half of us here. But he's done a lot of study of it. And, and so the runout rates of core ores will happen sometime in the 21st century, even when you allow for recycling, because every time you recycle, you lose some. It's not 100% yield, ever. So we get trickle back reuse. Aluminum is pretty good. What, it's around 50% for ferrous alloys now, maybe something more in that neighborhood for copper. So compared to what? So compared with what we did 50 to 100 years ago, that's pretty good. Compared with what we ought to be doing, maybe it's yeah, nothing. So I want to talk about this from the view of rare earths. Maybe some of you are really into this. But we tend to think of, particularly electronics, as a nice clean industry. So 
rare earth pops up in the news, even in business, it's only kind of occasional unless you're really into it. And so uh, about three, four years ago when the Chinese clamped down on exports of rare earths, and you can see that red line up there, that's the Chinese era, uh, it's still almost 95% of this stuff comes from China. And about half of that from just one of their mines, Baoyang. Uh, we have a mine at Mountain Pass, California. You can read the graph up there. We went through the Mountain Pass era. What happened to Mountain Pass? Well, as the Chinese came on, number one, they couldn't meet the China price. And then number two, they couldn't contain their affluence in particular. And the APA was on their case. So they nearly closed it in the late 90s reopened it, they still couldn't correct the problem, still couldn't meet the China price, and closed the place. And so something like 97, 98% of this stuff over the last few years came from China. So there are a lot of concern about this uh, from many views. So Mountain Pass is now reopened. Uh, Molly Corp, which is a joint venture company. Molly Corp runs the place. It seems to be doing okay, except you look at the stock price of this, and it yo-yos all over the place. I just saw yesterday where Siemens had signed an agreement with them, and the stock goes again. In about a week, they'll talk about how they're nearly bankrupt again, and the stock will go pew. And tying the bow tie together. Uh, you can go online and get pictures like this. They're not hard to get. So this is a guy carrying a sack of monazite at the Baoyang plant. Uh, down at the other end of it, that's Ghana, in what was supposed to be an electronics recycling center. And that's not the only one. And what do they, all these rare earths go into? Well, most of you know, but almost anything really high-tech, electronic. I certainly have it in my cell phone. There's about 25 pounds in each hybrid car. There's about, oh, 500 to 1,000 pounds in one F-35 aircraft. There's at least a pound or two in the adimium in a high-performance generator in a windmill. And so it goes. An awful lot of our corrective technology has this stuff in it. So how bad is this? This gives you some perspective. That's Baoyang. And you're looking out across their tailings pond. And at a far distance are some smokestacks. So this thing is big, and it's now, so what happened? The Chinese dropped the price, then they raised the price and restricted exports, and they kind of made their point, then they dropped the price again, and now Mountain Pass can't compete. There's an Australian company that also can't compete. The Chinese own 49%. The Australians wouldn't let them have all of it. There are protests against opening a mine in Malaysia. There are 20 sites under exploration in Canada. And if you really want an adventure, there's thought to be a big find of rare earths in Afghanistan. And the Chinese now say this stuff is depleting. They've opened a second mine in China, which appears to be a pretty good one. Now, this is Mountain Pass. It's not really very far from here. It's just across the Nevada border in California. Uh, this has been reopened. These are fairly recent pictures. But you look at that hole, it's pretty complete clean compared with China. That's the first thing you notice. Second thing is it's not nearly as big. And so... Um, Last numbers I saw, they were talking about squeezing out maybe oh, 12,000 tons a year. 
Last year, I think it was about three and a half thousand tons. Go back and look at the other picture. Total global output somewhere north of 150,000 tons now. Very small percentage. Now then, what's the perspectives on this? Depending on who you are, and this is the fascinating part. So if you're going to put down a note, this is what I want to start a conversation about. What are we assuming? What do we assume? And do we have to go down really deep and assume something very different because we're assuming a big fat lie? Or we're assuming something that if it isn't a lie, it is a terribly incomplete picture. So about three weeks ago, uh, CBS 60 Minutes did a program on it. What did they emphasize? You mean that national security of the United States depends on rare earths from China? Who allowed this to happen? A second one, the Chinese perspective. Going back about 30 years. We are the Saudi Arabia of rare earths. We shall leverage this to get ourselves into high tech. And it's been working. Why ship this stuff to the U.S. when you can come here and you can have it for a lower price? Uh, they say their reserves are depleting, so are they going to become more cooperative? Well, who knows? What does DARPA think? They've had several sessions on how we can become more imaginative in design and avoid using some of these that are most critical ones. But they're in everything, including LEDs. You know, you going to redesign all of it? Well, not quickly. Or can you design it to do anywhere near the same thing? And then there's the complaint: the Chinese don't play by our rules. Well, of course not. They're not that stupid. They got into manufacturing the same way we did a little over 200 years ago. They stole it fair and square. Everybody does that. They have. So there's no point complaining about it. They're not going to play by our rules. Because they want their people to live better. And they're caught in the trap, back to that second slide, they're caught in that trap between the environment and wanting people to live better, whatever that means. And depending on which account you read, which way are they going today? Are they going to open another mine like Bao Yang? Because in spite of all the sacrifice, by God, we are going to be a first-class country. Or are they really going to take care of the environment? How do you span that gap? BBC, I got a couple, three of the pictures from BBC. They're the ones that said, this is a god-awful environmental mess, and it is. The key point, we have a hard time trying to come up with any kind of unified perspective or a systematic perspective on any of this stuff. Oh, this is my fancy slide. You can applause now. Uh, just talked about rare earths. Go around that thing, pick any topic, and tie it in. Where does it tie in? So ocean pollution, endocrine disruptors, that's getting more news now. Most of us can't follow this. You can follow some part that, that really pertains to your business pretty closely and should. But then you go way off somewhere else and take an endocrine disruptor. Last I saw, the people looking at this had about 900 suspected ones out of all the chemicals. Everybody know what an endocrine disruptor is? No. no. It affects your glandular systems one part or another. So it can disrupt biology and it will do it for people and it will do it for animals. And so, to give you a for instance with frogs, atrazine is pretty well known as an endocrine disruptor of frogs, and the frog population, particularly the western United States, is down. 
And why? Because it deforms the male genitals of the frogs and they can no longer procreate. That's what happens. And at least for the male of the species, that generally gets attention. Could it do that for you? Yeah. Not a pleasant thought. You now it may do other things too that are a little less you know, dramatic. But in any case, they're slow acting. And this is the kind of stuff that sneaks up on you. Um, complexity is, yes, lost this back with you. Complexity is into this big time. Because the longer that supply chain gets, the more complicated it gets. And it doesn't make much difference what software you put on it. I observed that in factories a long time ago. What were people doing with the IT? Well, now we could manage a bigger mess than we ever could before. Where do you begin? Cre decrease the mess. The technology is wonderful, but what do you apply it to? Now, we go around this thing, but business has a hard time with it. You can't pay attention to all this. There are a lot of black swans out there, so what do we do? Put a very low risk number on each one of them. Since it's all low risk, don't pay attention to any of it. Or, if it's something critical to us, we'll try to figure out what our backup plan is. But most of the time, we just don't know what to do. And you can see some fallout. What's our problem? A lot of it is just plain excess consumption. Are there too many people in the world? Probably. But the real problem is we use too much stuff. And so if there were only 10 people in the world and we still use the same amount of stuff, you'd still have the same problem. And so somewhere along the line, you got to deal with this. How do we live pretty well? and use a lot less energy, raw material, stuff out of the ground, and try to deal with far fewer toxic you know, effluents and emissions. Now that's a tough design challenge. How to think about it. The environmental folks will call this a regenerative cycle. I think of it just as a loop. How do you make your loop think about return logistics? How do you make the loop really small? And the first thing that'll pop to anybody's mind without even thinking about this is an organic farm. An awful lot of it is self-contained right there. It regenerates itself and you don't even have to think about it. Now you gotta manage the cycle and you try to improve the cycle but nature's taken care of that one, and a lot of it's sold not too far away, and a lot of the inputs for it don't come from very far away, and so that begins to, to do it. So what's efficiency in that sense? It's a very low external energy input. So think about waste. Decrease the energy required for the cycle. And no matter how it's controlled, if you're shipping wood, you know, all over the world, this is not, this is high energy wood. Now go back to how we think about business. For the most part, the financial and accounting system about this stuff, plain, flat, is stupid. It cannot recognize what we actually do because it's based on each of these little chunks making money one stage at a time and if it successfully shows that, we have an increasing GNP and the world is fine. If you change that assumption, you have to change an awful lot of other assumptions. And we've been living this way for several hundred years now. Really, it's really built up. This, if I was going to say, what's the big challenge? Me, us. How do you change such a basic mindset? I'm going to go through just one example. Don't have very good slides to illustrate. 
this is a scientific cleaning network. Cleaning of buildings, just like this one. Uh, next time you see a janitor, thank them. If you go through an airport, how many of the janitors will actually look you in the eye? This is, in the U.S. and a good many other places in the world, this is the lowest tier of society. If you can't do anything else, maybe you can push brick. That's all too often how we think of it. So why don't we think of cleaning in a scientific way? I know in Europe that's better. At least a lot of places it is. So how do we do better? Well, there's a group, a network, a learning network. There are a number of universities that are involved, uh, some national labs, uh, some K-12 schools. Uh, there are some prisons that are not formally part of it, but operate somewhat this way. And they all learn from each other. They're all learning scientific cleaning and they share best practice. And a lot of the best practice is ideas that actually come from some janitor. And it may be just some little thing, but I can tell you two of the big ones. One was just take the detergent or whatever the cleaning agent is, pre-measured pack, fill the bucket to the line, drop in pack, you got the right concentration. Most janitors use too much and so the cleaning is ineffective and they use too much and then all that gunk went down the sewer. So where this system goes in, typically the volume reduction goes down by anywhere from 20 to 50 percent within about, within a few months. And then you switch it out. No more harsh chemicals. What's an illusion? That the chemicals have got to kill every microbe in a quarter mile radius. It doesn't need to. And in fact, it's worse cleaning. So you start to examine some very basic assumptions about cleaning that we may have learned from our mothers. Just uh, ammonia is a typical example. Ammonia is still used by a lot of people as a cleaner. It doesn't smell good. It's not a particularly great cleaner. You can do it much better, but what do people do? If it stinks worse, it must really be clean and good. That's instinct. That's how do you begin to change that? Then there's the research, and they ask some fundamental questions. They don't have much money, but they're looking at it. What does clean mean? And clean may not mean totally an antiseptic. You can have too clean an environment because we have an immune system. If you lived in an antiseptic environment and then you all of a sudden came in contact with a microbe, what's going to happen to you? And so when you say you want to clean for health, what do you do to hold down the pathogens and maintain a pretty good environment? And then you add another complication that in this room we probably have a lot of different backgrounds on microbial susceptibility, allergens, and how do you allow for that or can you? And then another question, what does cleaning do for the lifetime of the building? And in an architecture, how often does somebody design a building and they don't even think about where the janitor's closet's going to be? Much less what can be done with that building if it is properly cleaned, and that goes right into the maintenance of the building, and now you're extending the lifetime of the building. So this has a lot of ramifications, but we tend to get lost because, oh, anybody can clean. So what do we want to do with faster change? This little cleaning network is a pretty good example. I'll give you one. This is portion pack chemical. Um, did I skip one here? But portion pack chemical is a pretty good illustration of it. And I'm going to just go on to, oops, I'm going the wrong way. That's, uh, that's actually a class of janitors with their 100 and some hours of education. Can they learn this stuff? Yes, they do. It works. 
That's at the University of Texas at Austin, the picture. And they had people come in to talk about clean rooms. They learn how to find out more on, on the internet. Figure out how to take a pH. Fairly basic stuff if you're into lab work, but whoever taught a janitor to do that stuff before? And to kind of figure out what that means. I asked one of these guys, he was clean for a university, ask him, what do you wish your president knew about cleaning that you now know? He thinks a minute. I wish he understood that the top of his desk and his telephone have a far, far higher concentration of pathogens than a toilet seat. I didn't know that. Then just one of the suppliers, Portion Pack Chemical, it's kind of an unusual company, but it, th I think it's a harbinger of the future if you're beginning to think about a loop, a cycle. They want to be a really big company. Their objective is to be an example to everybody else. The lead in coming up with the best way to clean. By the way, in logistics, they have a problem now. They might want to talk with you. They've got these little packs. And you know, so how do you recover the polymer? And you're still shipping too much air. And so what do we need to do with the logistics to really trim this up? You know? Uh, but notice the mission. It's not to make more money. Now, they do make money, and they have, they have a nice Christmas party. But their objective is not making money. It, the business model is designed so that they make money. It's not the objective. They sell quite a few of these to prisons. And the prisons, as part of their labor training, uh, they sell some, ship some of it in bulk and they put it in the packs and then it's used by a lot of parts of the prison and maybe some other state installations. Something you'll notice, why, Boeing is the biggest commercial user of this. Almost no other big commercial user in par to companies. Could you imagine why? The commercial incentive is a big reason why. Imagine, say, a chemical salesman across the desk from a purchasing manager and what happens. The salesman is motivated by commission. The purchasing manager is motivated by purchase price variance. And so up to the limit of what the purchasing manager can bring out of the budget, they will fake it so that you got a reduction in price from what was probably, you know, you know the picture. What are neither one of them thinking about? What's a better cleaning process for my institution? You're not thinking about that. What's the gain to be in the next paycheck? A lot of industry people have known better than this for a long time, but we still don't do it. I can't make this go the right way. So, sum it up. Number one, I would like to engage in a conversation about this on what are we assuming, and I mean really dig deep. What do we assume, and how fast could we change assumptions? Just like with you know, Scott was talking about it. You can't change all this. What do you do that gives a company incentive to do something about the environment right now? Well, as soon as you do, you're using a measurement system that goes right back to the old expansionary model of business. And you keep fighting against ourselves. I call the second point quality over quantity, always. Like with cleaning, quality, cleaning, not quantity. What does Portion Pack do? They sell quality cleaning on an annual or multi-year contract. The amount of chemical required just comes with it. But the quality of the cleaning determines the money you get. And they have an educational program. 
And so a part of that is educating the janitor to sustain the quality of the cleaning and maybe to improve it. Economy of learning. A learning network can't be too big. And so if you get a global network, how much learning do you get from that and how quickly? Bigger is not necessarily better. How do you learn about a process faster? If you can see more of it, that's how. And we'll just skip to that last point. If you look at that circular system and we think stakeholders, who are the stakeholders in a circular process? And if you're kind of a lean thinker, you talk about a value-added stream. Well, value-added is an additive model of business. It adds value, and it's pretty linear. If you think about a loop, who are the stakeholders in the loop versus the stakeholders in that line? It begins to change your mind about a lot of things if we just can begin to think that way. So listen, I'd probably burn up more of my amount of time. If you've got questions, I'm glad to talk about it, but Scott's regulating the program. He's going to put the hook on me and throw me out in there. It's really changed recently that we're not doing quality over quantity, right? You know, our ability to throw so much crap away is what gets us into this mess in, in large, yeah. large extent. I mean, we were still making, uh, as, as people, we were really good stereo systems, for example, only 40 years ago. But now there's, you know, there's just no business. In the 1800s, if you weren't building your shovel to last for a long time, you were going to spend way too much time making shovels or your plow, but it wasn't going to last for long. You can't throw this stuff away. Just make it again in the fall. And so how did we, you know, the, this is an old model, right? How do we get, of course there were, there were, there were other attendant problems uh, yeah. at that time as well, but. Yeah. Uh, Learning from the past, was there a question there? I I, I don't know either if you go back to, let's say, old iron tools, they didn't last very long because they rusted quick. So you had to take pretty good care of them if they're all last, and some people did and some people didn't. So I, I don't know how to respond to that, except this, this consumption curve has taken off like a rocket, particularly in the last 50, 60 years. One more little statistic. Half of all the gold in inventory of the world today has been mined since 1950. And gold goes back as far as anybody, you know, it's one of the first metals was ever talked about. And so our ability to do this is taken off like a shot with a lot of waste accompanying it. Uh, I, I don't know how to answer that. Let's talk about it. Anybody else? Okay, thanks.